Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm really honored to be here. And when I look across a crowd like this, I wish I were doing the introducing of the speaker and then I could leave and not have to worry about it. Uh, that's really the feeling you get. I don't know what it is. The longer the years go on, the more uh, terrifying this calling actually becomes. It doesn't become any easier. Uh, Dr. Kluver was telling me he's in the Department of Communication here at the university, and he says how rapidly communication as a discipline is changing, that even after they complete a book, it has actually become outdated. And with that exponential growth and knowledge and the speed of dissemination and all kinds of issues that confront us, uh, it's hard to really keep abreast of everything that is going on. But the truth of the matter is you are here because you believe in the value of the subject, and out of courtesy, you're here to give an interactive time. I look forward to that time of interaction with you. Dr. Nabil Qureshi, as Dr. Kluver has said, will be joining me in the Q&A time. We are talking tonight about this whole issue of God or no God, and the issue of search for absolutes, especially in the realm of meaning and moral reasoning. The fact is that the question has been debated for many, many decades, if not centuries. It was the German philosopher Nietzsche who really popularized the phrase that God had died in the 19th century. But he also went on to say that because God had died in the 19th century, the 20th century would become the bloodiest century in history. But before I begin, I want to at least posit one important comment and that's mainly because so often the debate can get wrong-headed in these matters when caricatures are made of either of the two disciplines from naturalism vis-a-vis -vis theism. When the naturalist tries to explain everything from a naturalistic viewpoint and for the theist who does that explanation from a transcendent perspective of a personal, moral, intelligent first cause. Many times in that debate, uh, paper tigers are made of the other situation and then done away with, and it's really not uh, that good or intelligent argument. Here's a man by the name of David Berlinski. Many of you may have heard of him. Berlinski, well-known scientist, an agnostic, a skeptic in fact, reacted rather strongly to Richard Dawkins's book, The God Delusion. He was not the only atheistic scientist who reacted that way. Many others did as well. Philosopher Michael Ruse actually commented on Dawkins' approach as sort of giving the atheists a bad name. But here's David Berlinski in his book, The Devil's Delusion, responding to Richard Dawkins. And in the flap portion of the cover of the, of the book, he has these words. Has anyone provided a proof of God's inexistence? not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here? Not even close. Have the sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it is not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or in their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even in the ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? dead on. Now this is Berlinski. He has got no axe to grind for the theist. In fact, in his book he makes it clear that is not the perspective from which he is coming. And he talks very clearly about his agnosticism and skepticism and doesn't know where it is all headed. But he is clearly addressing this issue of false lines that are being created between the two. It was Galileo who made the comment. He said, the Bible is really a book about how, how to go to heaven, not about how the heavens go. And when centuries ago, thinkers can make those comments and remind us of the, of the 
barriers and the boundaries of the disciplines, it is important for us to keep that in mind. Michael Polanyi wrote a powerful book years ago. It was required reading for us at Cambridge, and it was called Personal Knowledge. Again, a warning that the disciplines had to honor their boundaries. But the question before us is the question of God or no God, the search for absolutes. My book, Can Man Live Without God, which was penned in, in the middle of the 90s after a series of lectures at the, with the Harvard Law School being the venue, the first in the Veritas series, I built the title of the book, Can Man Live Without God, based on Will Durant's famous comment. He said, the greatest question of our time is not going to be East versus West, North versus South, capitalism versus Marxism. Those are not going to be the questions. He said the greatest question of our time is going to be, can man live without God? And yet, how we struggle with that issue in this very day and this very time. In fact, it is becoming quite fashionable in some academic circles at least to mock that belief. The interesting thing is I've done a lot of work in the Middle East and the Far East. I have never ever seen a student or a faculty member there stand up and stridently or mockingly attack a theistic framework. They are much more prone to ask the question, which theistic framework do you go to? How do you defend the reality of this person you call God? It is fascinating. To look back over the last uh, little over a year when Richard Dawkins was on BBC uh, debating Giles Fraser, interacting with him, the former dean of St. Paul's, and Dawkins in his usual, usual flamboyant style was mocking Christianity. He's a bit of an intellectual coward, really. He didn't mock some of the other religious worldviews because he knows it may well be a farewell speech that he is making. <laughs> but he will mock Christianity. And in the middle of his tirade, he was discussing a survey that had just been conducted amongst the Christian audiences, some of whom couldn't name the four Gospels. So Giles Fraser looked at Dawkins and he said, Richard, your Bible is the origin of species by Darwin, isn't it? He said, that is correct. That's my, that's my sacred book. He said, all right, Richard, can you name the full title of the book? He said, yeah, I know, it's a longer title. He said, go ahead, go ahead, name it. Now, I'm giving you verbatim Dawkins' answer. He said, the origin of the species, um, um, the origin of the species, oh my God, for the life of me, I can't think of the rest of it. It goes by much longer than that, he said. How ironic that even an atheist had to call upon God to remind him of the title, <laughs> to remind him of the title that caused him to disbelieve in him. That's what you call ultimate poetic justice. The next day, the British news ran out taken place. All that aside, here are the words of Friedrich Nietzsche, born 1844, died 1900. And I think they're powerful. We have to listen to exactly what it is he's saying here makes it very clear what his end game is. The parable of the madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I'm looking for God, I'm looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there, he excited considerable laughter. Have you lost him then, said one. Did he lose his way like a child, said another. Maybe he is hiding. Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage or emigrated? Thus they shouted and shouted and laughed him to scorn. But the madman sprang into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Where is God, he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We're all his murderers. But how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns, maybe? Are we not perpetually falling backwards, forwards, sidewards, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not suddenly become colder? 
Is not more and more night coming on us all the time? Must not lanterns now have to be lit in the morning hours? Do we not hear anything of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's decomposed too, you know, and he is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him. Now, how shall we, the murderer of all murderers, compose ourselves? Because that which was the holiest and mightiest of all that the world had possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water can we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games will we need to invent? Is this not the greatest deed of all deeds? Too great for us, maybe. Must we not ourselves now become God? simply to seem worthy of it. There's never been a greater deed, you know, and whoever shall be born after us, for the sake of this deed shall be part of a higher history than all of history hitherto. The madman then fell silent and regarded his listeners. They too were silent and they stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern to the ground and it broke and went out. I come too early, maybe my time has not yet come. It has been related further that on the same day the madman entered diverse churches and there sang a requiem, Eternum Deo, let out and quieted, he said to have retorted each time, what are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God who is dead? We have killed him. A very powerful set of questions. Is there any up or down left? Must we not now have lanterns to be lit in the morning hours? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? You know, these philosophers were cautious, even though they were confident in their belief, they were cautious about the ramifications. They knew the entailments were going to be extraordinary and could ultimately result in the very decimation of man. I think this afternoon as I was studying, my mind went back to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, now long passed away. It was Solzhenitsyn when he was speaking at Harvard and talked, his talk was a world split apart. He made a comment. He said, when I was a little boy, I remember in my home in the former Soviet Union, watching my grandfather in a dimly lit room sitting around the table with my parents and family and there would be somber tones and a sadness about it all and the discussions would be going on of all the horrors that were striking their land as millions had been exterminated. My thought went back to him today thinking of what's going on to the poor Ukrainian people as tanks are rumbling through that, their streets now. Solzhenitsyn made this comment, he said, however it all went through the night at the end, it would be coming to an end when my grandfather would stand up at the table and make this comment. All of this, he said, is happening to us because we have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. And Solzhenitsyn told those prestigious audiences, he said, I'm an old man now. I have read tens of thousands of pages and I have written thousands of pages myself and I have come to the same conclusion my father my grandfather came to. The West is on the verge of collapse created by her own hands because between good and evil there's an irreconcilable contradiction, he said. And when we've forgotten God, there go the absolutes as well. Contrarily, listen to the words of Arthur Schlesinger speaking at Brown University at their graduation some years ago. The mystic prophets of the absolute simply cannot save us. Sustained by our own history and traditions, we must save ourselves at whatever risk of heresy or blasphemy. We can find solace in the memorable representation of the human struggle against the absolute in the finest scene in the greatest of American novels. I refer, of course, to the scene when Huckleberry Finn decides that, quote, the plain hand of providence requires him to tell Miss Watson where her runaway slave Jim is to be found. Huck writes his letter of betrayal to Miss Watson and feels all washed and clean of sin for the first time I had ever felt so in my life, and I knowed I could pray now. He sits there for a while thinking how good it was all this happened so, and how near I come to being lost and going to hell. Then Huck begins to think about Jim and the rush of the great river, and the talking, and the singing, and the laughing, and the friendship. 
Then I happened to look around and I seized that paper and I took it up and held it in my hand. And I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever between two things. And I knowed it. I studied it a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, all right, then I'll go to hell and tore it up. Schlesinger adds this line, that, if I may say so, is what America is all about. That, if I may say so, is what America is all about. Never pausing long enough to ask the question, was the situation that he represented in the points of tension not really a creation of the fact that the absolutes had already been forgotten? That's what brought about the predicament in the first place. Now, all of a sudden, on the heels of a relativistic end, relativism goes on and on and on and gets to a point where there is no point of reference for relativism on its own. Relative to what? To whom? At what time? In what place? And so the search for absolutes. The four issues that come crashing down, if we forget God, is the struggle to find a moral point of reference. Where do we turn for this moral point of reference? Who dictates this for us? Why do we make our choices? What are the absolutes? You know, I've been an itinerant now for four decades, and there are landmark moments in my life where I recall going back either to my room where I was staying or in a hotel room where I was staying, and sitting down at my desk and making notes on what all had just happened that day and that night and reflecting on how I myself was being changed in my thinking in the process. In my middle 20s, while I was an undergraduate student in Toronto, I'd been invited to Vietnam to speak to the troops, to the American troops, to the Korean troops and uh, the Australians and many others. I went from military base to military base courtesy of the American helicopter gunships and all that ferreted me and my interpreter around. I was in my 20s, just starting out. I remember coming back night after night when even the lights were out and trying on a flashlight to write my thoughts. My life was changing before my own eyes with what I had seen. But nothing as dramatic had ever happened to me as in the 1980s when I'd been invited to lecture at the universities in Poland. And my host was a man who had taken me to where I was speaking uh, the other in one, one particular town. And he asked me one day on a free day, would you be open to going to see Auschwitz? And I told him I'd already seen some concentration camps. He said, no, Ravi, this is not a concentration camp. This is a death camp. You must see it. So he put me into his car and we drove on this cold, cloudy day. The Cold War was still raging at that time. I was not emotionally prepared for what I was about to see. And as we pulled up outside Auschwitz and walked through that horrible looking place with so many memories of all the deaths that had taken place, I walked from room to room and I noticed in the handful of people there, from adults and young people, not one word was spoken by anybody to anybody. There was a pin drop, deadly silence. The pictures were doing the talking. One room with children and their children's pictures and their suitcases and their toothbrushes and their clothes and the boys of uh, the pictures of uh, twins experimented upon by Joseph Mengele as they were castrated standing there at attention looking nothing more than a sack of bones with an eye a gaze that defied anything you could imagine they looked like they were already dead on the inside how a surgeon an intellectual an intelligent man could have done what he did to these little children defies an imagination. I walked out of there stunned and then just before you entered the room with the gas ovens there was a statement by Adolf Hitler that said it all. I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless and cruel. Paul Johnson, in his book, Modern Times, draws a connection between Nietzschean ideas and Hitler's Holocaust. And he says how Adolf Hitler personally presented the writings of Nietzsche to Stalin and to Mussolini. And the whole idea of the Ubermensch, the Superman, 
Listen to how Nietzsche sustained this in his own writings. Listen carefully, please. It flies in the face of everything you and I believe here in this land. He says this, equality is a lie. It's a lie concocted by inferior people who arrange themselves in herds to overpower those who are naturally superior to them. The morality of equal rights is a herd morality because it opposes the cultivation of superior individuals. It leads to the corruption of the human species. The real truth about objective truth is that the latter is a fiction. Every candidate for truth must first be expressed in a language, and language is notoriously unable to get us to reality. Words like a hall of mirrors reflect only each other, and in the end point back to the conditions of their users without having to establish anything about the way things really are. Are. Truth is the name we give to that which agrees with our instinctives and our preferences. It is what we call our interpretation of the world, especially when we want to foist it upon others. But then he goes and says, ah, but even I'm still too pious so that even I worship at the altar where God's name is truth. Equality is a lie concocted by inferior people. Anyone who has studied the history of the Olympics will remember how Hitler reacted when Jesse Owens screamed the opposition and was winning medal after medal after medal. His theory of the Superman was falling on its face as he walked out of the arena, unable to contain the fact that his own, the best of his own were beaten. This is the ramification of what Nietzsche was really talking about when he said, say, that equality is, is a farcical thing that is concocted by the human mind in our own imagination and generally done by inferior people. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were to read the whole story of the way the Holocaust went and how it ultimately ended, I was involved in a lot of research after Eichmann's uh, trial had been held, and I was actually in Yad Vashem doing some research at that time and picked up an awful lot of information. And Hannah Arendt writes this about the trial of Adolf Eichmann at the end, and this is the conclusion I want to draw for you. She says this in the end of her book. Adolf Eichmann went to the gallows with great dignity. He had asked for a bottle of red wine and had drunk half of it. He refused the help of the Protestant minister, the Reverend William Hull, who offered to read the Bible to him. He had only two more hours to live and therefore, quote, he said, I have no time to waste. He walked the 50 yards from his cell to the execution chamber, calm and erect, with his hands bound behind him. When the guards tied his ankles and knees, he asked them to loosen the bonds so that he could stand straight. I don't need that, he said, when the black hood was offered to him. He was in complete command of himself, nay, he was more, he was really completely himself. Nothing could have demonstrated this more convincingly than the grotesque silliness of his last words. He began by stating emphatically that he was not a believer in God, that he was no Christian, and did not believe in life after death. He then proceeded, after a short while, gentlemen, we shall all meet again. This is the fate of all men. Long live Germany, long live Argentina, long live Austria. I shall not forget them. In the face of death, he found the cliché used in his funeral oratory. Under the gallows, his memory played him the last trick. He was elated, and he forgot that this was actually his own funeral. It was as though, listen to Hannah Arendt's words here, please. It was as though in those last minutes, he was summing up the lesson that this long course in human wickedness has taught us the lesson of the fearsome word and thought-defying banality of evil. The lesson of fearsome word and thought-defying banality of evil. When I had the privilege of being with Malcolm Muggeridge just shortly before he passed away in England, it was one of my dreams in life to meet Mr. Muggeridge. I loved the way he turned the phrase. I loved all of his books, and he was a late comer to Christ himself. And that afternoon, as we'd had a simple plowman's lunch of some crusty bread and cheese, we talked about all of his years and his own pilgrimage from, from as uh, editor of Punch magazine, mocking things and making fun of even religious things, to his ultimate conversion and his following of the path of Christ as his 
wife and his son and I were sitting having lunch. Then he got up, walked and showed me around. And Muggeridge told me this story sustained historically again by Paul Johnson, the historian, and confirmed over the BBC when Svetlana Stalin, the daughter of Joseph Stalin, told the story. She said, I could never figure out my father. Not a big man. But as he turned his back upon all these things sacred and so on, what actually happened was Stalin was a one-time seminary student going into the ministry. Then he lost his faith in God. And as he took over the reins, even Lenin voiced deep concern over the extremes to which this man would possibly go. And after having exterminated 15 million of his own people, two things happen. In the middle of that, a Western political leader came up to him and said, Mr. Stalin, I want to ask you a question. You are killing your own people at the tens of thousands. You're torturing them. How long do you plan to keep doing this? Stalin never answered her. He called a waiter, and he asked the waiter to bring a live chicken. And he took the live chicken, and in front of his guest, started to defeather that bird. Denuded it, put it down, and walked away with a piece of bread in his hand. The chicken hobbled over, nuzzled between his trouser legs. He bent down with a piece of bread to the chicken as it started to peck away at it. And he looked at his guest. He said, do you get your answer, ma'am? He said, I tortured this chicken. It'll follow me for food the rest of its life. People are like that chicken. You torture them, and they will follow you for food the rest of their life. You see, the definition of what this means, means to be human suddenly becomes murky, suddenly becomes blurred, because there is no ontic referent of an essential worth or a reflective splendor. And Svetlana said this to the BBC commentator. She said, I'll never forget the last thing my father did. It was the last physical act. He was lying in bed hallucinating. Suddenly he sat up and he clenched his fist towards the heavens one more time, threw his head back on the pillow, and he was gone. At the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow, where I had the privilege of addressing the entire faculty, which was atheistic, the general had taken me out and asked me some questions, and I'd answered him and told him this story. The head of the department of the entire faculty of the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow, eight stories above ground, four stories below ground, all of their leaders have graduated from there. As they lined up, first had been hostile, they shook the hand of my colleague, my kissed the back of my wife's hand, and then he grabbed mine, and here's what he said, Mr. Zacharias, your defense of God today, I believe, is the truth but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. That was his goodbye to me. America has been a great nation, is a great nation, and one of its great values, said Alexis de Tocqueville, is because the greatness of her faith and her spiritual values. And I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're really looking for absolutes, and you and I turn our back against God, where are we going to find it? I know Sam Harris and all make valiant, valiant efforts from evolutionary morality to well-being and all of that. Not a single new argument under the sun from them. Seven different kinds of humanism emerge, each of which in conflict with the other, looking for an ontic referent of what life's value ought to be. Morality goes. Secondly, the quest for meaning. What is it that really gives life meaning? We find it in so many different ways. We find it in our relationships. We find it in our loves. We find it in our accomplishments. We find it in the accolades that are showered upon us. And yet sometimes you find people with the greatest number of accomplishments end up actually being very, very lonely on the inside. I remember being at the home of a man in, in, in Hong Kong who was the seventh wealthiest man in the world who'd invited me to speak to what he called the Diamond Collar Group in Hong Kong. And the first night, we're sitting around the table, and I look at him and I say to him, why did you 
make the decision you did to follow God, to give your life to Jesus Christ. How did this happen? And he looked at me and he said, Ravi, some time ago I was sitting at the top of the building that we own. And I was sitting up there and I thought to myself, why am I so empty on the inside? So I get on the phone and I phone my wife and I say to her, I don't know if you feel the things I do. We have everything we've ever wanted, but I'm a terribly lonely man. She said, so am I. What do we do? She said, let's go to church. She said, do they have church on Wednesday night? She said, I don't know, but let's go. He said, where? She said, let's go to the one opposite one of our apartment buildings. Then we won't have to pay for parking. We can pay. We can park <laughs> in our apartment building. And they arrived there, and their journey to faith ultimately begins. So here's what I want to say to you. What gives life meaning? How do we find meaning in life? We talk about it as if it's something tangible. I've given it a lot of thought, and I've concluded that when you look for meaning, there needs to be a confluence of four realities in a person's life. One is the sense of wonder, the enormous sense of enchantment, that sense of wonder that a baby has, that a child has, that looks even at the simplest contraption and stays in awe, or that stay, stares into the mother's face and wants to say so much but can't, but the eyes tell the story, the smile tells the story. I'll never forget some years ago crossing over from a man Jordan through the Allenby Bridge across into Israel. The lineups used to be long and tortuous. You could spend hours waiting to be quizzed. It was my wife, my two and a half year old daughter, Sarah, and we were with our bags moving inch by inch. The bags are brought halfway by the Jordanian porter across the Allenby Bridge. The Israeli porter comes halfway, picks it up, takes you, and then you stand in line. And we're getting weary holding this little one with a lot of people still in front of us. And my daughter, Sarah, with her olive complexion being held in my wife's arms and then my arms, all of a sudden, totally out of the blue, she bursts out with this line, looking at an Israeli soldier armed to the teeth. She says to him, excuse me, sir, do you have any bubble gum? <laughs> You're just surrounded by these boys with their machine guns. Do you know what he did? My wife's Canadian, I'm from India, we have this beautiful olive-complected little girl in our arms. He takes his weapons and gives it to another soldier. And he comes over towards us and puts his arms out. And Sarah goes over to him. He takes Sarah into a back room. And he was there for a few minutes and now I'm beginning to have kittens over this whole thing. So what's happening here? He comes out, holding her in one arm, a tray in the other with three glasses of lemonade. One for my wife, one for Sarah, one for me. Moved us to the front of the line, got us through, put us in his Jeep, and drove us to the nearest taxi stand as we made our way on to Jericho. A little child caused the war to stop in the mind of a man because he was looking into the eyes of one filled with wonder. The Bible talks about this, how it, through the lips of infants he has ordained praise. That sense of wonder, enchantment, the fairy tale stories through which we come, which hold us in awe. My two and a half year old grandson's most common statement, Papa, tell me a story, tell me a story. And he'll just sit there glaring at you with his eyes getting wide, tell me a story, the enchantment. But you know, after some time you have to move beyond the enchanting alone, not the fantastic alone. You have to find out that which is fantastically true. Not just fantastic, but fantastically true. And the awesome capacity that God has given to the human mind. Even this very week, all that was registered with the, uh, with, the, with the gravitational waves that Einstein predicted so long ago would be discovered and found from the bang 13.5 billion years ago and so on. All this spectacular stuff that produces the great minds that give you and me this immense capacity to think, to think rationally, to think with rational inference, to think with the law of non-contradiction. 
I've suffered from back problems for many, many years and have two titanium rods bracketing me from L3 down to S1 with eight screws bolting me down. With all of our capacity, with all of our enchantment, with all of our technology, we still cannot replicate the spinal column. We still don't know the mystery and marvel of the eye. And that's when we have to step back, take a step back, and say how fearfully and wonderfully we have actually been made at the hands of an extraordinary creator. One who has this infinite wisdom and capacity. Wonder, truth, third is love. The majesty of love. The beauty of love. When my father-in-law passed away at the age of 85, his last words after being silent for a couple of days, he opened his eyes, looked at his wife of 60 plus years and said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone. My mother-in-law is still alive at the age of 95 or 96. She treasures those 60 some years of a devoted heart and the final goodbye that affirmed and honored her pristine and unique worth in the eyes of this one person alone. Augustine says, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Meaning, wonder, truth, love, and security. Those are the components that bring meaning to life. Without the absolute of a transcendent perspective, there is ultimately no moral law Secondly, there is no point of reference that you can find for meaning. And thirdly, there is really no hope beyond the grave. No hope beyond the grave. We have to realize, it's what Nicholas Walterstorff said so powerfully, this great professor from Yale who has endured a fair bit of tragedy in his own life he made this comment not too long ago, and I want to read this for you, and I think it is a brilliant comment. Here's what he said. Please listen. When we have overcome absence with phone calls, winglessness with airplanes, summer heat with air conditioning, when we have overcome all of these and much more besides, then there will abide two things with which we must cope, the evil in our hearts and death the evil in our hearts and death. And all these other bridges have been conquered. I'm coming here straight from Newtown, Connecticut. Need I say more? And the first night we arrive, we drive past the fire station where there are 26 star stars above the roof of the fire station. How do you speak to an audience like that? that has gone through what they did with 23 little ones slaughtered mercilessly and three adults as well. They had phoned me actually immediately after it happened and I said, you know, I had the privilege of being in Columbine, Columbine after it happened and uh, Virginia Tech as well. And I said the same thing to them I'm saying to you, give time a little working room here till some natural healing takes place. I said, give me a year and I will be there. And so the year comes and we are there. What are the two questions they're looking at? How does a carnage like this take place and evil like this get manifested where a 20 year old comes and slaughters the innocent? What do you say to a father or mother that's lost a little one? And I just say to you, Jesus himself understood this very well. When he comes into Bethany to the home of his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they're looking at him and saying, you know, if you'd really been here a little while before, you could have prevented this from happening. And he says, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. They say, we understand that. But if you'd come here earlier, you could have prevented this from happening. Jesus does the most amazing thing, I think, in the gospel narrative here. He walks up to the tomb and he realizes his friend Lazarus is dead and he weeps. You know, if this was some manufactured story, there would have been a cavalier attitude towards all of this. Oh, what are you guys weeping over? Don't you know I can do all of this? He weeps because he understands the weight of the loss human beings feel at the loss 
of a loved one. Even though the truth of the resurrection pertained and he raised him knowing the day would still come where he dies. In fact, Lazarus's grave is now in Cyprus and it's very briefly tested, written there, Lazarus, Bishop of Larnaca, twice dead. <laughs> friend of Jesus. Twice dead, friend of Jesus. Billy Graham was telling us a group around a table once, he said one of the most memorable conversations he ever had was in Germany. After the war and all of the tragedy, he said, I was in the office of Conrad Adenauer. And he said, Mr. Adenauer was pacing the floor talking about him, about all the tragedy that he had inherited and the sadness of what had happened. And then he said, he walked over to a window and he said, I'm behind him. And he says, looking out of the window, he says, Mr. Graham, I have a question for you. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? Do you really believe that? Billy Graham said, I shocked coming from a man of his stature. He said, Mr. Adenauer, if I didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he said, I would have no gospel left to be preached. He said, Conrad Adenauer walked around and then looked him in the eyes and he said, Mr. Graham, I want to tell you something that I believe outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. Outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. The paradigm from the eternal perspective that tells you life is not just lived in its three score years and ten. That there is a hope. That there is life beyond the grave. If I didn't have that firm belief, having buried my parents so early in life, it would only intensify the sadness and intensify the hopelessness. The hope that Christ gives is a down payment that you and I get in this moment that life has that eternal perspective. That's what Solomon said. God has put eternity into the hearts of men. That hope that God gives, that promise of the resurrection from the dead, that is the point of reference from which all else can ultimately be explained. Let me give you just three sustaining points in this. And one caveat here. The Bible is such an incredibly honest book. When Jesus is asked by his disciples, I remember the first time reading it as a young, young convert. I put the Bible down and I thought to myself, what on earth is happening here? The disciples look at him and say, when are you going to return? When are you going to return? If Jesus were a charlatan, if he were a fake kind of a messiah, do you know what he would have said? He would have said, I'm not going to tell you. That's exactly what he said. I'm going to keep you in that mystery. Instead, he says, of that hour knows no man, not even the Son of Man, in that emptying of him, his own prerogatives. He said he did not know the hour to give to the disciple who asked him. If Jesus were fake, he would never have made that statement. He would have just given some unfalsifiable claim like, few thousand years from now, or I'm, I'm not going to tell you. So he said, of that hour, no man knows, not even the Son of Man. The conversion of three dramatically involved individuals. Number one, Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. I remember being at the office of the chief intelligence officer in Damascus, not far from the wall. And he brought me in to interrogate me and tell me he knew exactly who I was and that they were going to track me through my trip in Syria. I said, that's fine. I'm aware of it. And then he says, just don't get involved in our politics and you'll be fine, Mr. Zacharias. He said, we welcome you here. We need you here. I said, thank you, sir. And then he looked, leans forward and says, this is where it all began, you know. I said, not quite, a few miles up the road, but this is where it continued. <laughs> and we shook hands with some baklava and coffee, and I left. Saul of Tarsus, his conversion to write one-third of the New Testament, that dramatic change. Number two, Thomas, who said, I'm not going to believe until I reach out, see, and feel. What did Thomas do? He went to India, and the oldest church in India is named after him, the Martoma Church as he arrived there and proclaimed the gospel 
and paid with his life and the conversion of James, the brother of Jesus as well. Those three dramatic conversions, apart from the hundreds that saw the resurrection, I say to you, with God, there is moral capacity of definition, there is meaning, there is hope, and finally I say to you, if there is no God, what hope is there for the transformation of the human heart and the redemption message that you and I really need? I want to close with two quotes. One comes from the world of rock music. One comes from a journalist who's a skeptic, which is fascinating. Andrew Fletcher, the Scottish political activist said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. My work at Cambridge University was in the romantic poets because I believe the poets will oftentimes reflect reality much more readily than those who can hide oftentimes under the cerebrally driven abstract structure of philosophy and so on. So studying these romantic poets taught me so much. But go back to our own poets in our time. King Crimson put it in these words. Cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeons scream for more from paranoia's poison door, 21st century schizoid man. Blood rack, barbed wire, Politicians, funeral pyre, innocents raped with napalm fire, 21st century schizoid man. Death seed, blind man's greed, poets starving, children bleed, nothing he's got he really needs, 21st century schizoid man. The walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death the sunlight brightly gleams. Will no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams? Between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time are sown and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh, but I'm afraid tomorrow I'll be crying. What do they say? The walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. Here is a skeptic, a man who amazed everybody by writing this article some years ago. One of my colleagues, John Jiroge from Kenya, sent this. He works with me in Atlanta. He sent this to me. And if you see this article, you quickly realize how amazing that this story is coming from a man who lives in a lifestyle and a choice of life that he does not uh, boast to be Christian. In fact, he says he's an atheist. And listen to this, and with this I close. It's a protracted series of, of, of uh, paragraphs, but here's what he says. Before Christmas, I returned after 45 years to the country that as a boy I knew as Nyazaland. Today it's Malawi. And the Times Christmas Appeal includes a small British charity working there. Pump Aid helps rural communities to install a simple pump, letting people keep their village wells sealed and clean. I went to see this work. It inspired me, <clears throat> renewing my flagging faith in development charities. But traveling in Malawi refreshed another belief too, one I've been trying to banish all my life but an observation I've been unable to avoid since my African childhood. It confounds my ideological beliefs, stubbornly refuses to fit my worldview, and has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. Now as a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts, these alone will not do. Education and training alone simply will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. This rebirth I have seen is real. The change is good. I have to tell you I used to avoid this truth by applauding, as you can see, the practical work of mission churches in Africa. It's a pity. I would say that salvation is part of the package. But Christians black and white working in Africa do heal the sick, 
do teach people to read and write, and only the severest kind of secularist could see a mission hospital or school and say the world would be better off without it. I would allow that if faith was needed to motivate missionaries to help them, fine. But what counted was the help, not the faith. But this no more fits the facts for me. Faith does more than support mission the missionary. It is also transferred to his flock. This is the effect that matters so immensely and which I really cannot help observing anymore. First then the observation. We had friends who were missionaries and as a child I stayed often with them. And he goes on and talks about the difference in their lives and so on. And then he talks about how he struggled with his own faith at, at, at an early stage. But this time in Malawi, I met, uh, I met no missionaries other than these. You do not encounter missionaries in the lobbies of expensive hotels discussing development strategy documents as you do with the big NGOs. But instead, I noticed that a handful of the most impressive African members of Pump Aid were privately strong Christians, privately because the charity is entirely secular and I never heard any one of its team so much as mention religion while working the villages but I picked up the Christian reference in our conversation one I saw was studying a devotional textbook in the car one on Sunday went off to church at dawn for a two-hour service it would suit me to believe that their honesty diligence and optimism in their work was unconnected with personal faith that their work was secular but surely affected by what they were what there was in turn influenced by a conception of man's place in the universe and Christianity had taught you know, there's long been a fashion among Western academic sociologists for placing tribal value systems within a ring fence beyond critiques founded in our own culture and they and theirs, and therefore it's best for them, authentic and of intrinsically equal worth to us. I don't follow this anymore. I observe that tribal belief is no more peaceable than ours and that it suppresses individuality. People think collectively, first in terms of community, extended family and tribe. This rural tradition mindset feeds into, feeds into the big man and gangster policy politics of the African city, the exaggerated respect for a swaggering leader, and the literal inability to understand the whole idea of the loyal opposition. Anxiety, fear of evil spirits, ancestors of nature and of the wild and of tribal hierarchy of quite everyday things strikes deep into the whole structure of rural African thought. Every man has his place, and call it fear or respect, a great wave, where weight grinds down the individual spirit, stunting curiosity. People won't take the initiative, won't take things into their own hands or on their own shoulders. How can I, as someone with a foot in both camps, atheism and this now, explain this? And then he goes on to say this, to the rural African mind, this is an explanation of why would not climb the mountain, etc. He goes on, let me move to the last two paragraphs here. Christianity, post-Reformation and post-Martin Luther, with its teaching of a direct, personal, two-way link between the individual and God, unmediated by the collective and unsubordinate to any other human being, smashes straight through the philosophical, rich spiritual framework I've just described. It offers something to hold on to those anxious to cast off a crushing tribal groupthink. That is why and how it liberates. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing them with material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted. And I'm afraid it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. It's amazing. Coming from Matthew Paris, that was amazing. May I close with a personal anecdote, friends? At the age of 17, I was a total failure in life. Total failure. No discipline, nothing. Never wanted to study, never wanted to crack open a book. I was always at the bottom of the class. I just wanted to do one thing, was play cricket. I want to play someday nationally, and even that I don't think I'd have made it, but I want to try. And one day I decided life had no meaning. The Sartrean caution was right. He said, the only question I cannot answer is why I don't commit suicide, but that would be to use my freedom to take away my freedom, says he. Well, I did try to commit suicide. No meaning, none, zero. And in that hospital room, a Bible was brought to me. 
I couldn't hold it. My body was dehydrated with the poison and all the expelling that I'd done. This man comes and leaves the Bible. He wanted to stay. My mother wouldn't let him because I was in critical condition. He opens it to a page to her, and she is told to read it. She didn't understand it. Reading from the King James with a heavy South Indian accent. I'm lying in bed, and she reads this verse. Jesus says, because I live, you also shall live. In that hospital room, that statement came alive to me.